Good morning, and welcome to this celebration of worship here at First United Methodist Church. We are glad you are here. We extend a very special welcome to all who are worshiping with us for the first time, and we pray that you find a meaningful service of worship with us here as we praise God together. I call your attention to the attendance card found there in the bulletin. Please fill that out and uh, put it into the offering plate later in the service. This allows us to be aware of your presence and any concerns that you might have. I also call your attention to the uh, calendar, church calendar that's found there in the bulletin. Please uh, make note of those opportunities for worship and service and fellowship and uh, come out and join us whenever you can. I also was asked to um, uh, please announce uh, church worship in all small, to church worship in all small groups, that there is a benefit dinner for Laura Drayton Bowman uh, this coming Saturday, May 19th, here at the church. Um, no reservations are needed. Just please come and join. The dinner is a three-course roast pork loin dinner with all the trimmings, and it's from 4 to 6.30. And again, no reservations are needed. As many of you know, Laura was diagnosed with stage 4 rectal cancer after Christmas, and she is really um, trying hard to, to beat this. Um, she has a lot of um, medical expenses, and some of those are not paid for. Um, if you cannot attend the dinner, checks may be made to Laura Drayton Bowman and may be sent to John and Carol Drayton here in Decatur, or you might wish to check out the GoFundMe page for Laura Drayton Bowman. Also today, we celebrate the... Um, uh, Fellow, uh, uh, golly, there it goes. Have you ever had those moments? <laughs> it's just, thank you, Bill. It just, it's gone. But it's the Fellowship of the Christian Home, also known as Mother's Day. And so I would like to take a moment just to say thank you to all of those wonderful, wonderful ladies out there who are moms, who have been moms to other people in need. And let's just celebrate them this morning. And let's say a prayer for them. Lord God, we give you thanks for all those who have so willingly given of their time, themselves, their love, to take care of, of those in need, to teach, to guide. Lord, bless those in our our church family that are moms or have been moms to those without. We ask that you surround them with your care and your presence and bless them fully in Christ's name. Amen. I also want to remind everyone, if you, a young person, are graduating from uh, high school, specialized training, college, or postgraduate, studies, or if you're a retiring educator, please let the office know this week so we can offer you recognition next Sunday. At this time, I invite you to stand and greet one another in the spirit of Christ.
let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we hear our prelude. Thank you, Kathy. Will you join responsively with me in the call to worship? Delighting in God's ways, we are like trees planted by streams of water. Abiding in Christ's mercy, we are like children sheltered against the storm. Filled with the Holy Spirit, we are one in Christ. Come, let all who draw breath worship the Lord. Let us pray. Fill us with your joy, O God, that our joy may be complete. Plant us like trees, Holy One, that the living waters of your mercy and grace may flow like blood through our veins. Guide us in the paths of righteousness, great Redeemer, that we may become one in your name and that your people may prosper. Amen. Will you stand as you are able and join in singing page 98, To God Be the Glory. Thank you.
seated. Will you join with me in the prayer for illumination? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. At this time, would the children please come forward for their children's message. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's a little better. That's a little better. All right, this morning I got a question for you. Who likes to work puzzles? Yeah? Maybe. Do you want, there's a kind of a puzzle called a maze. Has anybody done a maze before? How many have been through a corn maze? Yeah. Who's gotten lost in a corn maze? <laughs> With a maze, you have a start, right? And you're, the idea is to get to the other end of it, but there's all of these walls in your way, right? And you have to try and figure out, do you go right or left? Sometimes you have to go backwards and try again. Or straight, you're right, you're right. Like if you get to a, to a dead end, you gotta back up and try again. Or you went left, you should've gone right. That's why you don't <laughs> I totally understand. Now, life is kind of like a maze, right? We don't always know, should we go right or left? What's the right answer? You know, what should we do in every situation? Sometimes it's hard to make those decisions. Right, Trevor? Yeah. <laughs> I got an example here. I borrowed this from our nursery. So this is a kind of maze, right? Trying to figure out, it is an easy maze. It's a beginner's maze. So, you know, trying to get from one side to the other. Now the question is, you know, for, if this, since this one's easy, it's really easy to follow the right turns. And you know, life can be like this. Do you know how life can be like a simple maze? What's your idea? You're on the right track. Who can help you make the right decisions? God, right, and Jesus? Yeah. You know, there's some other, I have to say that God gave us some other people to help us with that. Your family, including your church family. Who out here would help people through, these kids through their maze of life? Look at all those hands in the air. I think you have some people to help you out, right? So Jesus is there to make your life as simple as this maze versus the corn maze you get lost in. So if you ever have a question about what to do in a situation, you can sit and pray about it before you make the decision, or you can ask all of these people that God put in front of you to help you through your life. All right? All right, let's say a quick prayer. Dear God, Thank you for putting these people in front of us. And thank you for helping us with the maze of life. And we just pray that you be with us and let us know your presence is known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do have one other thing to ask of you. Because as Pastor Mike said, today's Mother's Day, right? So I, when you go back to your seat, I want to give your mom a big hug. Or if there's somebody who's just a mom to you, give them a big hug, OK? All right, let's go. 
Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 15 to 17 and 21 to 26. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles." This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Our second scripture is from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 6 through 19. And this is when Jesus was praying with his disciples. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My friends, will you please say a word of prayer for me? Abba Father, you are the potter and we are the clay. Mold us, mold me into the image of Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Visiting preacher in a small town in Kentucky was concerned when he began the first night of a revival meeting and he noticed there was a group of men at the back of the tent with a rail, a bucket of tar, and feathers. Although rattled, he did the best he could with his sermon, and when finished, his anxieties heightened when he noticed that group of men coming forward with the aforementioned items. And he turned to the deacon who was there and expressed his concerns, and the deacon said, Oh, don't you worry. They're not coming after you. They're looking for the cuss who invited you to preach. Well, sometimes a pastor needs a place to hide after a sermon. In today's lesson, the writer of the Gospel of John captures the closing days of Jesus' life and ministry here on earth. In this chapter, Jesus prays for himself and for his disciples. Basically, he prays for three things. For his disciples, he prays for their protection, their preservation, and their perseverance. After Jesus' resurrection and ascension, his disciples lived in a world in which it was dangerous to be one of his followers. You and I are fortunate we face no such persecution. We may be ridiculed for our faith, people may call us naive, but that is hardly persecution. It always amuses me when some Christians in our land complain about being persecuted for their faith. Now, perhaps if we lived in the Mideast or 
some Asian countries or parts of Africa, we might experience persecution. But in fact, it, it's also sad in, in America, most likely Christians are the ones who will be persecuting others. However, Jesus knew all of this. When he was no longer with them, the hostility which fell upon him was going to fall upon them, upon his disciples. And it did. Almost without exception, they were imprisoned, tortured, and slain in terrible ways. But note this. When Jesus prays for the protection, he doesn't pray for their safety. The last thing he wanted them to do was to go around armed to the teeth. And when we pray for protection, we pray that nothing painful or harmful will happen to us. But Jesus knew better than that. He knew that we live in a world of pain. Some pain is unavoidable. Christ's disciples would experience pain because of their devotion to him. And there was no way to avoid that. So rather than to pray that they will avoid pain, he prays for unity. Now why would he do that? Well, it's because he wanted them to drive a certain car. That's right. He wanted them to drive a certain car, a Honda, so they would all be in one accord. Sorry, I've waited for years to use that joke. <laughs> Jesus wanted them to be unified. He wanted them to come together and be found in one another and sure in their faith to be in the same spirit, to be in harmony with one another. For there is strength in unity when you have friends and family and fellow church members to whom you can turn in times of trouble, you can bear almost any pain, any turmoil in your life. The church at its best provides that kind of support, that kind of oneness. And I love what Roberta shared with the kids this morning. They need to be able to turn to any one of us for that support, that love, that care. And we need to be able to turn to one another for the same. That is our church family. They are our support. The church at its best provides that kind of support and that kind of oneness. Preacher Barbara Brown Taylor gives us a picture of a church where unity provides comfort and security. She writes, like the emotionally challenged young man who showed up one Sunday in our church, and asks to become a member of the church. As careful as he tries to hide it, it is clear that he is out of everything, out of food, out of money, out of family to take him in. And how does her church respond to that young man's needs? She describes it like this. No one makes a big fuss. Very quietly, someone takes him grocery shopping while someone else finds him a place to stay. Someone else finds out what happened to his disability check while someone else makes an appointment to get his teeth fixed. And do you know what? Years later, that young man is in the front pew on the right, surrounded by his family, the church. Parker Palmer, in his book, A Hidden Wholeness, reminds us that the journey we are on is too tough to be made solo. The path is too deeply hidden to be traveled without company, and the destination is too daunting to be achieved alone. He reminds us that all of us need places where we can be safe enough and courageous enough to face our brokenness and discover our wholeness. He calls them circles of trust. He says we need more and more circles from which we can return to the world less divided and more connected to our own needs. This is the protection 
that the church has always provided for threatened souls, the knowledge that we are not alone, the knowledge that people are praying on our behalf. It is the protection of a loving community. It is a circle of people who will pray for us and stand by us. It is a safe place where people accept us even though they know we are flawed. At least that is what the church ought to be. And Jesus certainly prays for us to be that kind of church. Jesus prayed not only for the disciples' protection, but for our protection. He prayed that we would always have that kind of unity. A unity of being in harmony with one another, with a central purpose. To live in God's love and to share God's love. Secondly, he prayed for our preservation. That is, he prayed that none of us will be lost from the fellowship of believers. He prayed that none of us would ever slip away from our faith in God. And I love the way the psalmist put it, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone, from Psalm 91. Christ prayed for his disciples' preservation. And we are surrounded by that company of angels. Jesus himself holds us in the palm of his hand. He will not let us go. He will preserve our soul, says the psalmist in another reading from 121. He will preserve us to the very end. As the good shepherd, Jesus took care of the flock entrusted to him. He allowed none to be lost. Shepherds know that sheep are prone to stray, and good shepherds leave those sheep that are safe in the fold and goes in search of the one that has gone astray. He doesn't let it perish. <clears throat> he will always be there for us, no matter how far we may stray. Jesus also prays for our protection. He prays for our preservation. And finally, he prays for our perseverance. He prays that we will be steadfast in the faith. You can see why he prayed for those early believers. Perseverance the whole world depended on them. They had not done their duty to witness to Christ and his resurrection. We would not have the faith we have today. And this would be an entirely different world. It is impossible to overstate the difference that the coming of Christ made in the world. Look at the barbaric behavior in so, in so many places where Christ is unknown. And imagine what our world might be like without the influence of Jesus Christ. Jesus taught us compassion and understanding and acceptance. He taught us mercy and forgiveness. He taught us to love our neighbor as he first loved us. We respect people of all faiths. But it is horribly naive to say that all faiths and philosophies are the same. No other faith, for example, teaches people to love their enemies. Think what a difference it would make in the world today if all nations, including our own, adopted that creed. Love all. To love all. We would not have the gospel today if those early believers had not persevered. But here's what we desperately need to see. The future of the faith of the church depends on us just as it depended upon the first disciples. 
The future of the world may very well depend on us and how we reach out to others and to love others as Christ loved us. And the world is changing rapidly and some wonderful things are happening such as unbelievable advances in medical technology. We've talked about different things like this before. The 21st century will see advances in every field. But one thing remains the same, the heart of humanity. And we are flawed creatures. Our basic instinct is to look out for number one, even if the result of the instinct is cruel to the well-being of others. It's simply what the Bible calls sin. And because we remain flawed, the future is uncertain. We can have heaven on earth, or we can turn this earth into hell. It really is up to us. However, I say to you with all sincerity, this world will not be saved unless the gospel of Christ is proclaimed throughout the earth, unless the gospel of Christ is lived out before the people who are longing and searching and are hurting. They need to see Christ alive in us. They need to experience Christ's love for them through us. This is our purpose, to proclaim Christ and his love to the end of the kingdom of God until that kingdom comes on earth, a kingdom of peace and love for all. We cannot forget why the church exists. It exists to proclaim the world, to the world that Jesus is the light of the world. And he is the light. He is the light. He is the light of the world. Where his love is unknown, there is nothing but darkness. We must persevere in our work of witnessing to Christ and his resurrection, the future of faith is at stake. But even more important to Christ, the future of the world is at stake. Will the world one day live in the light of Christ's love or will we be plunged into prolonged and perilous darkness? It's up to you, it's up to me. Christ prays for our protection, that we will be unified and hold one another up when trouble comes. He prays for our preservation, that none of us will be lost from the fellowship of his family, his family, the church, remains the world's best hope for peace and reconciliation. And finally, he prays for our perseverance that we will persevere in telling the world of Jesus and his love. My friends, we need to let the world know of the glorious friend we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to join in our hymn of response number 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Thank mm -hmm. you.
let us turn to God for prayer. Hear our prayers, O God, lifted for others and for ourselves in your name. And we pray, Lord, for faith to trust your love, to truly experience Christ's grace and spirit that is with us always. Lord, we pray for the leaders in the church and in our world who are courageous, just, and open to your leading. For their willingness to stand firm in traditions that continue to bring life and truth. Lord, we also pray for an openness to step out of traditions into innovative ways you would break open to us. to help others to see you more clearly and to love you more dearly. And Lord, we pray for discernment of those who consider new vocations and fresh opportunities to serve. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with issues of health and for those who are experiencing grief in their lives. We pray, Lord, that you would surround them with your presence and hold them close, lift them up, and let them know that they are loved. Lord, we pray for communities open to entrusting leadership to a new generation. And we pray for guidance for those individuals that will carry the torch forward. Lord, we pray for the upbuilding of the church and your loving creation through our actions. And Lord, as we come before you this morning, we ask you to help us to pray with open hearts and minds our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. Source of eternal life, speak your saving words of life to us once more when we follow the advice of the wicked and sit in the seat of scoffers. Return us to the delight of your teachings and the joy of meditating on your ways. Spirit of reconciliation, we celebrate the love that heals us and makes us whole. We rejoice in the love that binds us together in communion with you and with one another. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Hear these words of assurance. The Spirit loves and protects us that we may all be one with Christ and one with another. The Spirit sanctifies and completes us that Christ's joy may be made complete in us and we may rest in God's peace. As a joy and peace-filled people, let us pray the prayer that he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let us show our devotion to God and God's commandments by offering our love to the world as we offer our tithes, 
gifts and offerings this day. Let us pray. Like trees planted by streams of living water, Holy One, may our lives bear fruit that feeds a hungry world. Like tender shoots that reach for the sky, may the gifts we bring this day bear the fruit of your bounty in due season. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let the ushers come forward as we hear our offertory.
invite you to remain standing and join in our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance. join me responsibly in the benediction. Sent into the world by Christ. Touched by the joy of knowing Christ. Made one with God and with one another. My friends, go with God and go in peace. Amen. Amen.